foreign policy in Latin America to a large extent. But I'd like to begin by putting this policy in a broader context. I believe to understand U.S. foreign policy in any part of the world, one must first understand that the United States seeks to dominate the world. Once one understands that, much of the seeming confusion and ambiguity and contradiction fade away. And to, ex to express this quest for dominance numerically, one can consider the following. Since the end of World War II, the United States has, one, attempted to overthrow more than 50 foreign governments, most of which were democratically elected. Two, grossly interfered in democratic elections in at least 30 countries. Three, waged war or other military action in some 30 countries. Four, attempted to assassinate more than 50 foreign leaders. Five, dropped bombs on the people of some 30 countries. And six, suppressed dozens of populist or nationalist movements in every corner of the world. Thank you. Um, the cost of pursuing such policies each year could pay for completely free health care for everyone in, in, the, in America and for free education all the way through the law school and, or medical school or whatever you want. Imagine that. Just stop waging wars. And th these things and much more are ours. Do you know we're now waging war against the people of five countries? Five. Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iraq, Somalia, and Yemen. Is there something wrong with us? Imagine if, if our president was not a Nobel Peace Prize winner. <laughs> Latin America has not been in, uh, militarily, militarily invaded or bombed by the U.S. as much as Asia or the Middle East. Uh, instead, in, uh, in Latin America, we have focused on assassinations, overthrowing governments, and suppressing popular movements. About two dozen Latin American governments have been our target for overthrow since 1945. And Latin America is number one for the U.S. putting in power and supporting dictatorships. The rise of relatively progressive governments in many Latin American countries in recent years is certainly something to cheer about. But I'm worried how long it will last. Honduras so far has been the only one to fall. But there are, there are undoubtedly any number of all-time military officers in places like Guatemala, Nicaragua, and El Salvador who are just itching to, to uh, copy what they did in Honduras. Or in Paraguay, where the new president, Fernando Lugo, has recently instituted close to free medical care for all people. I can just hear the generals in Paraguay saying, we don't need no, no stinking socialist government with its stinking communist free health care. They're, they're just waiting for someone at the Pentagon to casually nod their head. And that's the end of any of these experiments. And, and once, once they, the head is nodded, the Obama White House will embrace the Paraguayan Caldeos just as they've done with the Honduran Golpistas. The latest show of support on Honduras was the announcement by Mr. Mrs. Clinton of the resumption of an aid to Honduras and the urging of Latin American countries to recognize the Honduras government despite its serious and daily violations of human rights. As was mentioned, seven local journalists have been murdered in Honduras. The Honduran uh, Golpistas have known since day one of their coup 
where they could count on dear old Uncle Sam for support. Now, just what is it that, that dear, our dear old uncle is so afraid of? Have you ever heard of a man named Jack Kubish? K-U-B-I-S-C-H. At the time of the overthrow in 1973 of the democratically elected government of Salvador Allende in Chile, the socialist government, Kubish at that time was Assistant Secretary of State for Inter-American Affairs. In the wake of the Chilean coup, Kubish was hard pressed to fend off accusations by all over the world that the U.S. had been involved in the Chilean coup. He issued a statement saying, quote, it was not in our interest to have the military take over in Chile. It would have been better had the Yendi served his entire term, taking the nation and the Chilean people into complete and total ruin. Only then would the full discrediting of socialism had taken place. Only then would people have gotten the message that socialism doesn't work. What has happened has confused this lesson, unquote. That is as concise and as clear a description of the, of the ideological underpinnings of U.S. foreign policy as you're ever going to hear from the mouth of a high American official. Though based on a falsehood that he made up for the occasion that again these policies were leading Chile to ruin, when in fact that was not the case at all, Kubush's words articulate a basic goal of U.S. foreign policy, preventing the rise of any society that might serve as a successful example of an alternative to the capitalist model. Many underdeveloped nations during the Cold War were punished by the U.S. for attempting such a model. Cuba is still being punished. So, to use Kubish's word, it's better that such societies suffer, quote, complete and total ruin, rather than build a successful social society. Isn't that amazing? How's that for a foreign policy we can all be proud of? Better that they all die and suffer than to have a social society. During the Cold War, Washington knew no heresy in the Third World but genuine independence. In the case of Salvador Allende, this uh, independence came, came clothed in an especially provocative costume. A Marxist, constitutionally elected, who followed the Constitution. This would not do. It shook the very foundation stones upon which the anti-communist temple was built. The tenant, uh, painstakingly cultivated for decades, that communists can take power only through force and deception, that they can retain that power only through terrorizing and brainwashing the population. Washington ideologues could imagine only one thing worse than a Marxist in power, and he elected Marxist in power. And today, the Washington ideologues are faced with Marxist or socialist leaning leaders in about a dozen Latin American countries. It's not a happy time for the State Department, which would all like, which would like all the nations south of the border to, to emulate Colombia. Last year, the Pentagon acquired the right to seven new military bases in Colombia. This was followed by Colombia announcing that it was sending a contingent of soldiers to Afghanistan under NATO command. Just what these poor, uneducated young Colombian soldiers needed to go and fight in a war in Asia, to kill and die in a conflict of which they had virtually no understanding at all of. But of course, the same can be said about the American soldiers fighting in Afghanistan. It's the height of irony. Latin American countries almost never <coughs> engage in war with each other or any other country. But now, under Washington's thumb, Colombia is going halfway around the world 
to wage war. And have you ever thought about the school of the Americans in this context? For decades, Latin American military officers have been trained by the U.S. in the art of warfare and torture. But for what purpose? To use against which country, against which invading army? There was none. The School of the Americas has been training its students to suppress and torture their own people. Who else? Colombia is also a key element in Washington's effort to overthrow Hugo Chavez in, in Venezuela, against whom a never-ending propaganda campaign has been waged in the American mass media. You've heard part of, it, of that from our previous speaker. Chavez is one of those world leaders I categorize as an ODE, an officially designated enemy. And once a foreign leader becomes an ODE, the American media do not have to be told by anyone how to proceed. Any fairy tale can be attached to an ODE. For example, we're, we're told repeatedly that Chavez has suppressed his media opponents. Yet Venezuela has something the U.S. does not have, an opposition press. If you doubt that, consider this. There are about 1,400 daily newspapers in the U.S. Can anyone name a single one of them, or a single TV network, for that matter, which was unequivocally against the U.S. invasion of Iraq, Afghanistan, Yugoslavia, Panama, Grenada, or Vietnam, or even against any two of those. How about one? Can you name one media, one TV network, or one daily newspaper that was against, totally against the invasion of any of those countries? Seattle Post Intelligence. <laughs> okay, so that's one out of 1,400 newspapers. Daily newspaper. <laughs> Is, is all this just a coincidence? Where is the media opposition to American foreign policy in, in this land of the free and home of the brave? Imagine if many hundreds of labor leaders and, and dissidents were killed in Cuba or Nicaragua as they have been in Colombia. And, and, now, and now it's beginning in Honduras. You would never hear the end of it from our mass media. One of the main points I emphasize in my writings is that anti-American terrorists are created by American foreign policy, not by religious fanatics who, who brainwash them. I have cited numerous examples of terrorists who have explained exactly how their actions, how the actions of the U.S., their invasions, their bombings, their overthrows of governments, their torture, how these actions have inspired the anti-American acts of terrorism. And there's no reason for them to lie about this. Terrorism is essentially an act of propaganda to catch the world's attention and promote a certain cause. And it works the same all over the world. In the period of the 1950s to the 1980s in Latin America, in response to numerous hateful policies of Washington, there were countless acts of terrorism against American diplomatic and military targets, as well as the offices of U.S. corporations. The Latin Americans didn't need any kind of religious inspiration to take revenge against the Yankee tormentors. And in this context, I'd like to mention but I don't think that the U.S. war on terror is a war against Islam, as many Islamists and others claim. The war on terror is actually a war against anyone opposed to the empire. For many years, going back to at least the Korean War, it's been assumed by both the right and the left that the U.S. bombing targets chose people of color, of color or, 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 or Muslims. But it must be remembered that in 1999, one of the most sustained and ferocious American bombing campaigns ever 
was carried out against the people of, of the former Yugoslavia. 78 days in a row of non-stop bombing of Yugoslavia. The people there being white, Christians, and Europeans. So it's not just people of color or more Muslims. Anyone who stands in the way, the only two qualifications for a country to qualify to be a bombing target of Washington. One, it poses a sufficient obstacle to the desires and goals of the empire. And two, it is virtually defenseless against aerial assault. Getting back to Latin America with a comment about class conflict, which hasn't been uh, mentioned today at all. In 1972, I traveled by land from San Francisco to Santiago, Chile, to, to observe and report on Salvador Allende's socialist experiment. One of the lasting impressions I, I received on my journey through Latin America is of the rigid class order of the societies I passed through. There are probably very few places in the world where the dividing lines between the upper and middle classes on the one hand and the lower class on the other are more distinct and emotionally clung to uh, than in Latin America, even in, 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 in the UK, it's not, it's not as bad. In the Chilean capital of Santiago, I went to look at a room advertised by a woman, and she assumed because I was an American that I was against the government. The same assumption she would have made if I had been, I had been European. Because she, she very much wanted to believe that the only people who would support someone like Salvador Allende were the, the poor, dumb Indians, the, the indigenous, and, and their dog. Only they supported the government. And she was pleased by the prospect of having an American living in her home. When I, when I, when I was obliged to corrupt her, her misconception about me, she was visibly hurt and upset. And, and I felt bad because I felt I had betrayed her, her trust in me. Uh, there's a classic American story of the servant of the family of the oligarchy. He bought steak for his patron's dog, but his own family ate only scraps. He took the dog to a vet, but he never could take his own child to, to a doctor. In Chile, under Allende, there was a terrible nagging fear amongst the privileged classes that the working class no longer knew their place. And in the 1970s, throughout Central America, you had a similar phenomenon. The, 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 in that region, the servants rose up against their superiors and, and, and their government and their superiors' governments, who were fully supported by Washington. The same polarization I speak of has taken place in Venezuela under Chavez as he attempts to build a more egalitarian society. Keep that in mind to better understand what's taking place there. The Venezuelan privileged classes and their soulmates in the American government and mass media criticize Chavez and his policies. And as the State Department and other agencies continue their attempt to destabilize the Venezuelan government. This thing of our class lies at the basis of that. <coughs> Keep in mind as well, for many years now, in Sweden, they have been able to examine children of a certain age, taking their height and their weight and various health measurements, and are then not able to tell which social class a child came from. Isn't that nice? They have ended the worst part of class warfare against children. A class warfare American leaders would be shocked and offended to be accused of here at home. And yet, that is what US foreign policy has been supporting for, for a century, class warfare against children. I'd like to close with a word about the country of Latin America that's closest to my heart, Cuba. The American mass media never make its readers aware of a certain basic fact of life, 
so I do whenever I have a chance. This vital political fact of life is that the, that the United States is to the Cuban government like Al-Qaeda is to the government in Washington, only much more powerful and much closer. Since the Cuban Revolution, the U.S. and anti castro Cuban exiles in the U.S. have inflicted upon Cuba much greater damage and loss of life than took place in New York and Washington on 9-11. Cuban dissidents typically have, have had very close and indeed intimate relations with, with the government of Washington. They are closely financed and supplied with all kinds of equipment. Would the U.S. government be concerned about a group of Americans receiving funds and equipment from Al-Qaeda and meeting in Washington at Al-Qaeda's office? You, you, you know this, this office would, would be closed down immediately and everyone in found and South would be sent to Guantanamo. But this is what Cuba faces all the time with, with, with these agents from, from Washington. And this is the way to view Cuban dissidents. Cuba is not suppressing their free speech per se. They're suppressing, they're suppressing what to the U.S. would be Al-Qaeda. Cuba is in great mortal danger of its revolution being overthrown from, by, by the U.S. And these people sent down by the U.S. Are, are nothing less than agents of the government. They're paid for, they're given all kinds of equipment, they're given office space in the U.S. And, the U.S. Embassy in, in Havana, it's a very close connection. Why should you be surprised that Cuba would arrest such people? They, they would be crazy not to. And, and the evidence they have against what these people are doing is much greater than the evidence the US, U.S. has against people called, uh, accused of being members of Al-Qaeda. Cuba has had agents of their own in infiltrate these dissident groups. And they, they, they know exactly what's going on. So let me, let me repeat the point I'm making. If any Americans were being financed and supplied and working closely with Al-Qaeda anywhere in the world, let alone within the U.S., what would be the response of the U.S. government? We all know the answer to that question. And so keep that in mind the next time you read about, quote, Cuban political prisoners, unquote. I thank you very much.
and, and, and the actions they've taken. It's very obvious to me that the U.S. was never uh, opposed to the coup. And they had no choice but to say certain things when the entire OAS membership was against it. So they were forced to say some certain things. But even now, they, 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 like me, they're the only country in the Western Hemisphere which recognizes the, the, the true government. No, they're, they're actually not the only ones. Uh, Colombia, perhaps. Oh, so right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think Panama and I'm not sure, but there's there's a handful of countries that have recognized. Peru also. Well, until, I think until recently they were the only one. Um, and the last one is the question. I, I'm very interested in learning more about what you saw, what your personal experience was in Chile in 1972. I think that would be very interesting for you. Well, it was a marvelous experience. Uh, the, uh, the, there was no question in my mind that the, the government of Allende meant very well by the, the mass of the people. I mean, I, I, I visited places where the, the poor people, homeless people, were building their own houses. They were given the land and, 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 the, and the tools and, and the, the wood and so on. And they were building their own And then they would move into these houses after they finished. Um, that's just one example I can give of many of, of how the, the government meant very well. As opposed to the statement I read by this former U.S. official that Allende was bringing the country to total ruin. Yeah, he, he was speaking of the upper class, maybe, not, not of, of, the, of the mass of the people. So, uh, no, I'll stop there. Yeah. Um, just, uh, I guess, two brief um, kind of follow-ups on uh, what you've said. Um, the first, uh, with regard to the U.S. position vis-a-vis -vis the Honduran coup, um, a guy named Mark Weisbrot, I don't think yeah. he's here today, but uh, uh, he lives in D.C., he works for the Center for Economic and Policy Research, uh, wrote a, well, he writes a lot of uh, good analysis. He writes a weekly or bi-weekly column, uh, usually appears in the Guardian newspaper. Uh, but he wrote a very nice uh, December piece, um, well, top 10 ways you can tell which side the United States government is on with regard to the military coup in Honduras. Um, so he goes through a lot of the um, different facets of the U.S. response, and it shows that indeed, you know, despite official condemnations about the usurpation of power, um, the U.S. response has been profoundly, you know, ambivalent to say the least. Um, so I would encourage you to do a search for that if you want to see it, I have it right here. Um, and then uh, the second, um, it's interesting um, that you uh, bring up the Chile example um, and the, the quote from Jack Kubish about uh, you know, just letting the end they fail um, and sort of these socialist policies just driving the economy into ruin. Um, because I think that's a, a theme that we're seeing repeated now um, with countries like Venezuela and Colombia. Uh, there was just a piece, um, I think it was on Thursday, uh, in the Washington Post by our friend Juan Ferrero. Um, talking about uh, you know, the Venezuelan economy and how Chavez's policies have just you know, wrecked the economy, which you know, at least up until 2008, that wasn't the case at all. Um, so uh, but there's a, a pretty persistent theme here that um, these things don't just uh, go away. Can I add to this point, because uh, if I may, the policy, of, as I understand, the policy under Kubitsch's uh, administration in the State Department was to let them fail. But if everything, and, and you can anticipate that with the kinds of changes that Allende was, was presenting, there would be adjusting difficulties in adjusting the economy to a whole different way. Of, uh, so some difficulties were to be expected. But they were not failing fast enough. And there was a trucker strike that was funded by the CIA so the tune of $25 million, remember, we were looking at uh, 1973, and it's equivalent to what, $100 million today, maybe more. Uh, and for a country that moved everything by, by, by truck, it paralyzed the country. And that was, the idea was to, they were not failing fast enough, so let's have them fail faster by funding a trucker strike. Now, it seems that the military jumped to the gun and actually took over the government and, in fact, forced the U.S 
to recognize, to uh, applaud the coup after it happened. But there, there, that seems to, and I pose it as a question, do you believe that in fact the military, the Chilean military in fact went on acted on their own, and that the, the preferred policy of the U.S. seems to have been at the time, let them fail completely? Yeah, I don't think that the military should act on their own. There, there were U.S. <coughs> warships off the coast of Valparaiso, the day of the coup, that's where the coup began, right there on the, on the coast. Uh, there were all kinds of things one can say uh, about what happened on that day, but not that the, the, the Chilean military acted on their own. It, it, it made no sense. They, they knew they would have to have the full support uh, of, of Washington and, and, and the arms and so on. They, they would not uh, go up on their own like that. Okay. Uh, it is now. Uh, what's the time? 11.02. We're supposed to break at 11.10. I do have a couple of announcements to make that... Uh